Welcome to the show, Drinking Mommies. I'm Whitney, one of the founders of the group Drinking Mommies, and joining me tonight is co-Drinking Mommy, Kate. Hey, everybody. We have a few topics we wanted to discuss tonight, so I hope you're ready. First one up is parenting news and what we should be aware of. The next thing that we're going to talk about is fitness and motherhood and how one mommy actually makes it all work. Next up, we have mommy mishaps. It's not just you that screws up. And then we also have some crazy things that our children have said. We're going to end the show with our super mom of the week. We're going to nominate a new person every week. And if you know of a mom that you want to nominate that you think deserves recognition, just go ahead and message us on our Facebook page, Drinking Mommies. For our first news story of the night is actually going to be coming from a petition that's been going around the nation. The petition is calling for three of the major airlines, American, United, and Delta, to make it so parents don't have to pay any additional fees to be seated with their children ages 13 years or younger. And honestly, I think this is a topic that we all need to be made aware of as parents for several pretty obvious reasons. The big one being that children under the age of 13 are, I mean, let's be real, Kate. They're really susceptible to people who are creeps on planes, which, you know, as a fellow woman, we've had to endure that a time or two as oh, adults. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's anxiety inducing. I mean, how would you feel being separated from one of your girls on a flight? Oh, it wouldn't be good at all. And I mean, my children are pretty self-sufficient and my eight-year-old flies alone all the time because her father doesn't live in the state. But when you're traveling with your child, there are all these different things that you need to take into consideration um, when caring for your child during the flight. I mean, you have to think about their fears. So you have to address those. Um, what if they get motion sickness from the plane um, and they're puking everywhere? You can't have them sitting next to a stranger without you right there and they're puking. Um, and all of the endless snacks that they need constantly. Kids are then the bottomless pits. Seriously, what is with kids? What, what's with airplanes that makes kids eat that much? But then well, you also have to think about the entertainment aspect of it. They're in a plane. They're bored as heck. So there's so many different aspects to think about. Well, and like you mentioned earlier, the, the significance behind this particular petition, which makes it important for parents to realize is when children are flying by themselves, they are under the care of a particular airline stewardess who's assigned to watch over them. So kids are in a certain section of the plane under close supervision of one stewardess whose sole job is to make sure those kids are safe. Right. When, when they split children up from their families on flights, you don't have that same protection that you would if your child was flying alone. Because there isn't this airline stewardess who is going to be focused on one to five kids. It's on all the passengers of that section, which increases the risks, like you mentioned before, of stranger danger or sickness or just general fear or anxiety because they're seated around a bunch of strangers. And I mean, I've had this happen and I've raised the fuss before where I've even pre-booked my tickets in advance. So I've picked my seats. And once I arrived to the gate, they're like, oh, your seats have been reassigned. And my son and I have been separated. And at one point, my son was only seven years old. And I was like, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. You're going to have to either reassign other people. Like, I don't care if I have an aisle seat or whatever. You're, I'm not going to be separated from my child on the flight. No, that's absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that even assigned seats get reassigned, the chosen seats get reassigned without regard to who the passenger is whatsoever. That's terrible. It's bad customer service. I mean, come on. Oh, it absolutely is. Just cattle being prodded on the plane. But don't even get me started on, on customer service when it comes to, um, when it comes to three, all three of those airlines. I mean, I've had terrible experiences just traveling myself, never mind with children on those airlines. It just amplifies things so much more. Oh, yeah. And in all honesty, to all of our listeners out there, if you are interested in signing the petition, it's currently, as of tonight, sitting at 
over 129,000 signatures, but they need 175. We'll be sure to post a link to the petition on this podcast. So if you would like to sign it and share, please do, because honestly, this is going to benefit every single one of us as parents. And if you're not a parent, do you want to be seated next to someone else's unsupervised child? Probably not. Right. I mean, what kind of inconvenience is that to the other people in the seats? That's ridiculous. It is. <sighs> Even the most well-mannered child can go bonkers on an airplane. Oh, so true. So yeah. very true. So our second story of the evening is actually, I think, a pretty big topic in its own right as well. Now, this is the push to save what is known as the adoption tax credit. Now, for those of you who have never had to go through the process of adoption, which is lengthy, expensive, and incredibly stressful, one of the the benefits to the adoption tax credit is that you get a little bit of money as either a a one-time sum of $13,570 or a portion of the adoption um, provided by the government as a reimbursement when you file your taxes at the end of the year. For those that don't know, the cost of adoption in the U.S. is around $37,000 for babies. If you are adopting overseas a newborn child, that cost could be over $47,000. If you're adopting a child that is already in the foster system, that cost can be around $2,600. But in all honesty, that's a pretty low-end estimate because it's taken into consideration that there's no one fighting for custody, that there's no ongoing medical expenses, or other problems that are occurring that are either going to draw out legal proceedings or medical appointments, et cetera. And these stats actually come from a survey that was done by the North American Council on Adoption for Children, which honestly is something that they do every single year. They tend to provide really thorough surveys. So these estimates are pretty spot on, but like I said, I mean, the 2600 is pretty low ball for children that are already in the system. Now, Kate, what are your thoughts on this? So just even looking at the numbers, listening to the numbers, you said it was $37,000 to adopt a newborn in the U.S., which most people want to adopt newborns because they're easier. You are growing with that child. Um, you're not starting in that child's life after, you know, 10 years or so. So, you know, infants are, um, are the most adopted, but that's still $37,000 and the tax bill only gives you back 13,570, um, per child, which is less than half of what you're paying to adopt this child. Um, it's, it's crazy that they would even try to take that away. Um, but I think the main thing that we need to do is look at lowering the cost of adoption. I think that that would be the most beneficial. It would leave fewer kids in the foster system. Um, it, it would bless a whole lot more families who want to, um, increase the size of their family or who can't conceive things like that all of these different people would be um, benefited by just simply lowering the cost of adoption. But that's not something that's on the table and that's not something anybody is going to put on the table anytime soon. No, and so, I mean, at least that, that tax advantage is at least a sliver of benefit financially. It is. And it's especially true considering that 60% of the children adopted in the United States come from lower to middle class families who have an average combined salary of just 75000 a year. Think about that. If a newborn baby is $37,000 and your combined household income is only 75000 for a year, that is a huge financial upfront investment, not including the cost of raising the child overall. Absolutely. If you add people, that and, and college and everything else onto yes. it, that's insane. It is. And it's amazing to me because let's be real. If you have a child in the system, 
you have foster parents that are also getting some sort of kickback from the government, albeit it's not big, but there is some. You cannot tell me that when you're looking at strictly an economic perspective, that it is advantageous for these children to sit in the system and not be adopted. Like lowering the cost would also make it so a huge financial burden is being taken off of the government because, I mean, listen to these stats, Kate. Like this is gonna blow your mind. So children who don't get adopted because, well, it's expensive and time consuming and legal battles, it's so stressful. Like this is a show topic all its own. Oh, so yeah. you are not adopted from the system. Only 6% graduate college. Now these stats come from the National Council for Adoption. 40% hold of the- Hold on, let's rewind for one second. You said only 6% graduate college. Yes, and it gets When worse. they are not adopted. Yes. Now- and it gets worse. <laughs> why- why have we not done more to fix this? I know, girl, I'm telling you, it is I mind mean, blowing. It is so mind blowing. Student, student loans and everything else. Yeah. I mean, that helps go to the government. The yeah. schools get, the schools are funded and I don't know all the intricacies of it. And I'm oh, not yeah. going to pretend that I do. The economy to to get these these students and if not college at least trade schools right like, like they need to get into some sort of school to have any sort of successful life or we're just perpetuating it oh yeah and girl i'm not even getting to the worst of it yet so oh no of, of these children who do not get adopted 40 percent of them at some point in their life is going to experience some form of homelessness 40 percent that's almost half yeah almost, almost half. half of the children who do not get adopted end up with homelessness at some point in their life yes 48 percent will be unemployed and 60 percent 60 percent will at some point in their life be convicted of a crime 60 okay percent so so what you're saying here is that there's a crap ton of crime, there's a crap ton of unemployment, and there's a crap ton of homelessness, and there's little to no college graduation. Yeah. All of these things can be addressed and remedied by these kids getting put into a loving and supportive home. In order for them to get put into a loving and supportive home, the cost of adoption should go down to increase their chances of adoption. Exactly. And so cutting the tax credit that people get, which is so measly in the grand scheme of things, it's like, how greedy can you get? I mean, you want to fix the system. You want to create productive members of society. You want to get people out of the prisons. You want to get them off of the streets. You know, look at the root causes, get these kids in homes where they can be with loving families. Right. That's where it comes. That's where the nature versus nurture um, argument can come into play from a psychological standpoint. If you nurture a child well enough during their most formative years, that child is going to learn a set of morals and a set of beliefs um, and behaviors and coping skills and all of these different things. So that way they don't turn to the maladaptive behaviors that they would learn elsewhere, like on the streets or in gangs and things like that. So there goes the homelessness, the unemployment and the crimes. And you nope. know what? For better chances of employment, get into a loving home that can actually support you and give you clothes to put on your back that are appropriate for you to where to work, yep. where you can actually get your paycheck sent to, where you can set up bank accounts and, and all of this stuff you need, they need to get into a home and it, charging families $37,000 or more to adopt a child to give themselves 
more meaning to their life and to give the child more meaning and a better chance at life, that's absolutely ridiculous. That My pisses children. me off. No, well, it pisses me off too, especially with how many children in the system right now. It's, it's unreal. There's oh, over yeah. 100,000 children in the system. And it's oh. like, why can't we get them into homes? Well, part of right. it is this financial burden because like I said before, when you have 60% being adopted from families with a combined household income of 75,000, we need to help them out. And I am 100% for helping get these kids out of the system and into homes because honestly it's beneficial for everyone in our society absolutely everyone. absolutely okay i think that we could beat this topic over the head and we could get into a really really heated debate about this um so i think we should move on to our next topic which is fitness in motherhood Ooh, um, yeah. i would like to completely turn it over for a few moments to our lovely Whitney, um, who has somehow, and bless her, I have no idea how in the F she does it, but she somehow makes time in her schedule for fitness and makes fitness a pretty big part of her life. And I'm so super proud of her for it. But Whitney floor is yours. Tell us how you do it, please. Yeah, I'm going to fall off this dang pedestal you put me on, girl. <laughs> so honestly, it's been a lot of trial and error over the years. I'm a mom of a nine-year-old and it started back when I was pregnant. I told myself like, I am going to get into a routine where I am going to stick with it and find something that works for me. And so what I'm going to tell you is a basic roadmap of what worked for me. But honestly, you're going to have to take and run with it. So take all of what I'm about to tell you with a grain of salt and just know that not everything's going to apply and you might pick and choose what does. So I will let everybody know right now that I have a pen and paper here and I am taking notes on what she's about to tell us. So my first big bullet point, like I briefly touched on before, is establishing the routine. Making a roadmap for yourself to be like, okay, I'm going to work out, just start small. I want to work out for one to two, maybe three days out of the week, and I'm going to stick with it. You need to tell yourself, okay, what's a realistic time? Is it the morning? Is it the afternoon? Is it the evening? And that's going to be based on your schedule. Whether you're a stay at home, a working mom, mom of one kid, single mom, multiple kids, it doesn't matter. You're going to be able to find something in your schedule that's going to work for you. So just establish a routine and tell yourself, you know what? I'm going to try and stick with this the best I can because that's all we can do. Our next point that I really want to try and hammer home is start small and set realistic goals. If you're gonna come hot and heavy out the gate saying, you know what, I'm gonna work out seven days a week and I'm gonna run a marathon when, okay, girl, let's say you've been sitting on the couch, been watching Netflix, which I got it, we all do it. Wow, way to call me out like that. Are you kidding? Way to call me out. I do it too. <laughs> but to come hot and heavy out the gate is honestly gonna set yourself up for failure. So you've got to start small and set realistic goals. If that's just one day a week, like, hey, my routine is going to be on Wednesday for 45 minutes, one day a week, you know what? Do it. Once you establish that routine and you start checking those blocks for those goals that you set, you're going to build your confidence and you're going to be able to grow from there. If you take so much on your plate and you just end up dropping it, guess what's going to end up happening? You're going to stop. You're not going to want to continue forward and you're going to give up because it's self-defeating. So do not set yourself up for failure. The third point is going to be a little controversial and it's not going to work as well in every stage, but it's sleep. Sleep. Oh, that's my favorite. It's so important <laughs> because if you do not have an adequate amount of sleep, your likelihood to be motivated to work out is going to be lessened. Your recovery time post-workout is going to be longer because your body is not recovering as it should. But also your mental state of mind is 
horribly affected by sleep deprivation. If you are tired, you are going to be upset, you're going to be angry, and you do not want to be in that mindset when you're working out. You want working out to be a positive experience for you. So if you go in like all poopy pants out the gate, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm using mom words, huh? You're, you're, you're going to, once again, you're going to set yourself up for failure. And I got it. If you're a mom of a newborn, that can be hard. If you have to try and get power naps in while your baby's napping, you know what you got to do, you got to do, but just try to prioritize sleep because that's be real. I know that many of us, because I did this too, when I could have been sleeping, when my son was born, I was surfing Facebook. I was reading comments on articles that I had no interest in just to look at the dramatic ones. I wasted an hour or more a night. So I know I could have gotten more sleep. Oh no, no, not me. I slept literally every time my daughter slept. Now with Madison, I slept all the time. She's my older child. My younger daughter, Samantha, I had already had Madison and Madison was four. So she was a little self-sufficient, but still very needy. So there was very little sleep there, but let me tell you, now that they're both completely self-sufficient, I love my afternoon naps if I can get them. Oh, they're cherishable, aren't they? So yes, sleep is incredibly important. With sleep, you also have fuel for your body. And a lot of us have tried meal prepping and meal planning, but let's be real, that doesn't always work out like how we plan. That takes up so much time too. Ordering pizza and putting the different pizza slices in Tupperware containers is not meal prepping. Okay, so I had pizza for dinner last night and uh, Wendy's burgers today. I like Wendy's burgers. Yes. It They're was... always fresh, never frozen. <laughs> okay, sorry. I had to get super corny there. That was not a plug for Wendy's people. But I mean, let's be real. They are fantastic. They really are. <laughs> So meal prepping and planning, like with step number two, start small realistic goals. Prepping for an entire month probably isn't going to work for you. So if you can just focus on one meal a day, like, you know what, I'm going to plan my breakfast. I'm going to plan my lunches or I'm going to plan my dinner. Start with one meal, stick with it, and then go from there. Like I said, you take off more than you can chew. You're just going to stop doing it. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. So don't do that to yourself. Just start small, build from there one meal, and then build to all three. Our next step is going to be to find a workout program that works for you. This is incredibly important because you're going to have friends of yours who are going to be die-hard yogis or die-hard runners or die-hard crossfitters, but that might not be a program that is best suited for you and your abilities because you might have injuries, you might just hate cardio with a passion. It doesn't matter. So I always recommend to people before you commit to a gym or a certain workout program, go try them out. A lot of these places, if not having a week long free trial, will sometimes have 30 days. Try a spin class, try yoga, try CrossFit, you know, go out there, try a jump on a treadmill and run. See what gets you motivated, what you look forward to doing and go from there. So on that topic, um, when I was in Alabama with you, the only thing that I found that I could do with any sort of consistency was walk. And I got on a treadmill, set the incline, and then I would set the speed and I would put a book over the face of the treadmill so I couldn't see the screens at all. And I would just walk. I mean, granted, I had to have my spandex because, you know, my legs, my thighs would chafe. But there were a couple of days where my now ex-husband came down to the gym looking for me because I had been there just walking on the treadmill and reading for six hours, which is crazy. But now the treadmill's in the basement and it hasn't been used in well over a year. But it could come out. But you know what? It also worked for you at a point in your life. So you know that that's something that you can go back to. Right, exactly. I did a lot of my um, uh, 
homework reading, my textbook reading on the treadmill as well. Hey, multitasking. Yeah, you know. Gotta do. Our, the next point, and this is something that I have come to find to be the most high contributing factor to my longevity in any workout program is finding your fitness tribe. I suck at self-discipline. If I don't oh, have girl, me too. There to hold my feet to the flame, I find either a workout buddy that might be a friend with a similar goal. Um, I also am in a workout class. So I'll find someone there and be like, you know what? My goal is to keep up with this person. Or my goal is to be further than that person over there. You know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Finding your fitness tribe can really help to hold you accountable and to keep you motivated. Yeah, when it comes to the fitness tribe thing, when we were in Alabama, you were my tribe. We would sit there, we would go to the gym on base and I remember you showed me this ab workout to do just about every day. And it killed me the, first couple. <laughs> it yeah. killed me the first couple times. And then after a couple of weeks of doing it, it was so much easier. But let me tell you, I still cannot do a pull up to save my life. That's okay. I go through phases. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. You know, <laughs> and honestly, that's what leads into my last point is don't give up. You are going to go through phases in your life where you are going to stop. You're going to fall off the bandwagon. again. You're going to be like, oh crap. Everything I did just got thrown out the window and I feel like I'm resetting from zero. But you know what? I don't believe that. I don't believe we reset from zero because we still have all of that experience from before we have a plan that worked before that we can always fall back on. So it's not from zero. You just can't stop and can't beat yourself up too hard when you do. I've had times where I've gone almost a full month without working out. And now granted ladies, you're going to be like, Oh, I'm up. but I, I am always in positions for work where I am in very physically demanding jobs. Yeah, when I was in the army. I had to stay physically in shape. And then when I became a firefighter afterwards, I'm a wildland firefighter, I've always had to maintain some level of physical fitness. But even in those like professions, I've fallen off the bandwagon before. And you just gotta get back on, you gotta keep going. And that's where those tribes come in handy because they'll push you. And either they're nice about it or they're mean about it, but you know what, either way, you can use it as a catalyst. I think I might need somebody to be really mean about it and call me fat and call me lazy. So that, so that way I get off my couch and go to the gym. You need to find the, uh, oh, the Simon Cowell of fitness. I do. Oh my God. <laughs> the Gordon <I> Ramsay of fitness. <laughs> now I have to ask you a question. How do you keep yourself motivated? So for me, my motivation doesn't come from wanting to like look good or be in shape, but I tell myself if I am not in shape, then I am a detriment to my team. This last fire season, I was on a hand crew that was very physically in shape and I had to push myself to some pretty extreme levels that were outside my comfort zone but it motivated me because I knew if they needed me, I had to be able to either carry them out. I had to either push myself or I was going to be a risk either to them or to someone else. So I didn't have the luxury of being able to quit on myself because I had other people depending on me and that is something that has carried over to me even to this day when I'm not in fire season is I stay fit because I need to be in good shape for either my family if something happens heaven forbid but also for myself if I find myself in a bad situation 
I have to ask Whitney, what difficulties have you faced? Like starting out, maintaining your schedule, other people giving you negative feedback, things like that. What type of difficulties have you faced with this? So when you first start working out, it gets really hard because you, you have a lot of self-doubt. You think that you can do things outside of your ability. When I started CrossFit, I thought I could lift a lot heavier things than I could and kind of brought me back down there really quick. Everybody, I would like to uh, mention that it's been about 45 minutes in the show and she has mentioned CrossFit twice. I don't have a problem. Stop pointing it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you have to be realistic at first. And when you work out, it doesn't matter if you're first starting out or you're a seasoned athlete, you're also going to get injuries. And I've had injuries that have laid me out for months where I couldn't do anything, knee injuries, ankle injuries, it happens and it is incredibly self-defeating and it's kind of depressing. You get to this point where you start thinking, oh gosh, I'm losing my gains or how am I ever gonna get back to that point? You just gotta tell yourself, let my body heal because when I first would get injured, I would never let my body heal to the full extent my doctor recommended and it caused me a lot of problems in the long run. So I had to overcome that. And uh, lastly, you're going to get people when you start your fitness journey, especially if you have never worked out a day in your life, who are going to not be happy for you. They're going to say things that are going to make you feel like you're selfish for working out or that you are wasting your time. You know, the negative Nancy comments and you cannot let those get to you. Well, screw Nancy and her negativity. Damn her. <laughs> and if it's Nancy's listening to the show, we love you. <laughs> yes, Nancy's, we love you all. It's just like the name Karen. Karen's, we love you. Or do we? Oh, come on now. <laughs> so to our avid listeners, we're going to be moving on to our next topic of the night, which honestly is the funnest, I think. So, <laughs> so as moms, we have mishaps, right? We have things that go awry and are not our proudest moments. So this segment is called It's Not Just You. Oh my goodness. Moms everywhere. Screw up. Moms screw up worse than you have. You're going to screw up bad. You're going to think you might be the worst mom in the world, but listen, we all screw up. And our two stories for tonight are going to make you feel just a tad bit better about yourself. So <laughs> we have a mom and I kid you not. So there is this viral Twitter video with over 4 million views going around of a mom who got up in the morning, was on her way to her child's school, and when she was over halfway there, she realized, <laughs> was alert, she forgot her kid. <laughs> she left her kids at home, the kids <laughs> that she was bringing to school. She gets almost, she gets over halfway to the school and realizes that the kids she was supposed to be bringing to school were still sitting at her house. Yep. They were oh, man. all, and you know, I, I have these moments, not driving halfway to the school, but I have, I have gone and walked out to my car before and I was like, oh, oh man, <laughs> I, I have done that before and it, it happens, especially if you are sleep deprived because you're not getting the sleep that you need. Seriously. Find those crazy things. That is exactly why my children, eight and 12, know how to work my coffee maker. Granted, it's only a Keurig, so it's not all that difficult. But they wake me up in the mornings with coffee usually, especially if it's a weekend and it's before eight o'clock. They know I don't like to get up before eight. So if they want me awake before eight o'clock in the morning, they make me a cup of coffee and bring it into me and they'll put it on my nightstand and then they'll kiss me to wake me up. And then I'm at least one coffee deep before I really have to function and do much. I've been waking up wrong every single morning. My child does not know how to make me coffee. Seriously. Why are you just now telling me this? I feel like uh, this is a conversation you should have been like, you know what, mom has. Um, so it started off just mother's. No, I'm sorry. No, I think it started off just mother's day. And then a year or two later, 
the girls were like, oh, wait a second. It's Christmas morning. Mom doesn't want to get up yet. Granted, I love Christmas, but still, I love my sleep. So they're getting up on Christmas at like 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And that's absolutely bonkers. So they were like, hmm, maybe we should make mom coffee. So they did. And now it's just almost, it's, it's a weekend thing for the most part. I love that. But, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. That's why he's a step up his game though. It makes it so much easier. Yeah, he really does. But it makes it so much easier if you get the creamer that flavors your coffee and sweetens it because then they only have to worry about putting a little bit of creamer in and your coffee's either going to be a little bit too light or not light enough, but doesn't really matter. It's coffee. So our second story for It's Not Just You, there is a mom. Her name is Heather and her son, Hunter, who suffered a really embarrassing laundry mishap at school. (laughs) So this mom, I kid you not, she had her, she did her son's laundry, but she forgot to put in the uh, dryer sheets, right? And we all know what happens to clothes that get put through the dryer that don't have any dryer sheets to, you know, catch that electric, you know, static buildup. And she gave her son his clothes and, you know, Hunter gets all ready, goes to school. While he is sitting there, I kid you not, in music class, his mom's thong falls out of his pant leg and he is so mortified poor kid has to grab the thong and shove it back up his pant leg and hold it there in hopes that no one in his class just saw his mom's thong fall out of his pants (laughs) oh man man that's awesome (laughs) you know what at least he had the decency to keep it and give it back to his mom and to like try to hide it again. He could have very easily, I mean, I don't know how old this kid is, but he could have very easily been of an age where sex and sexual activity were like the cool things. And he could have been like waving it around being like, hey, I've got a thong because I just did this sexual activity with some girl. Because you know kids will sit there, especially if they're like high school age and all. Oh yeah. But you know what? This kid has his mom's back because he hid it and he gave it back to her. So you know what? And those can be expensive too. Oh yeah. Loyalty on this kid's part. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's so cool too because like she made a video as well and you could just see that she had a cool enough relationship with her kids where they could just laugh it off, you know? Because this is what happens in life. And it's not like the thong was stuck to his butt, you know, in some sort of static (laughs) shot. Like, it could have been so much worse. Let's be real here. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) No, honestly, that's something that would probably happen to me, you know, in my life. Probably. Probably. (laughs) So to all the moms listening, like, seriously, it's not just you. There are mishaps that happen on a daily basis to all of us. And honestly, when you look back at most of them, they're pretty hysterical. Okay, so yesterday, I, um, yesterday I get out of work. I pick my daughter up and we get to the house. And then I realize I never grabbed my house keys. Oh, no. So I was completely locked out of my house. I live on the first floor of an apartment. I went around my house, checked all my windows, found one window that was unlocked, and I don't know why it was unlocked. It's locked now, though I'm tempted to unlock it again. But I had to pick my daughter up and send her through the window so that way she could unlock the doors. (laughs) great (laughs) but they're tiny they can fit through they can't well I have gigantic windows but there was another time that I was doing laundry downstairs in my basement and locked myself out of my first floor apartment and all of my windows were locked except one off the kitchen and I was in it was I had just moved in in March so it was late March so it's freezing up here 
and I'm in these little booty shorts and a tank top, um, barefoot. And I'm running around my house trying to find open windows so I can crawl back in. The only one I can crawl back in is too high for me to climb. So I grab this huge stack of, <laughs> grab this huge stack of lawn chairs that I had in my garage and I pull them out. I put them, I put them under the window. I climb up those almost fall and break my face. And I finally climb into my apartment, but it, it seriously took me about 45 minutes to figure out how I can get up into this window because it was the only open window. But at least there was an open window. No kidding. Because so my cell phone was in here. I had a candle burning. It was bad. Everything was wrong. Oh man, it was so bad. I've locked myself out of my house, out of my car, and every time it's just like I just have this feeling of self defeat, you know, where I'm like, really? Did I really allow this to happen? Right. One and then time, I was locked out of my house and my car. So I just locked my keys in the car. I couldn't get in the house. So I'm sitting outside, but I did have my cell phone on me, and I had to call my husband to come get me, like to open up the door. And as I'm sitting there, I kid you not. What are those stupid Google Street View cars that take pictures? Got a picture of me walked outside my house, and for like two years, there was a picture of me with this like distressed look at this stupid Google car that captured the whole thing. Why never? Why had you never told me about that? I totally would have looked that up and kept the picture. It's gone now, thankfully. But it was just like, really? You're just gonna take salt? You're just gonna rub it in that wound? Totally. <laughs> what happened it was awful. awful oh my goodness <laughs> oh man and so <laughs> we have a great leeway into the next topic so we are actually going into my child said now for all of our viewers out there if you have something crazy that your child has said please message us on facebook and share with you so we can highlight you and your child on this show our First example comes from Tessa in Texas. Backstory to this little quote is she was sitting there and playing a Bible study DVD for her son. And she's sitting there thinking, yeah, you know, I'm a really good mom. My child's learning about Jesus and blah, blah. So her son stops and turns to her. And instead of saying anything like enlightened about what he learned in the Bible or asking any questions, I kid you not, he turns to her and says, mom, you're older than Jesus. <laughs> I tell that my boyfriend that all the, the time. Takeaway. That was the takeaway. I kid you. Oh. oh, man. Now, Kate, you have a good one, too. Oh, okay. So my 12-year-old, Madison, um, she is at the stage where, I mean, granted, she's 12. So she, things come out of her mouth before her brain processes them. Um, so she has tons of funny things all the time. But my favorite was picking her up from her father's house, from her other parents' house. And I see her in this sweatshirt. It's a navy blue um, Converse, the Chuck Taylor um, sweatshirt. It's super cute. Um, and I, I comment on it because I hadn't seen it before. And I said, oh, Maddie, that's an awesome sweatshirt. I love it. She says, thanks, mom. It's my favorite. And I look at her feet. She's not wearing Chucks. So I say to her, next time you should probably wear Chucks with it. She looks at me super confused with like a snarl on her mouth. And she goes, what are Chucks? No, I'm like, girlfriend, you're wearing the brand on your sweatshirt. You claim it is your favorite sweatshirt. <laughs> but you don't know the brand <laughs> you you don't know what chucks are so we went shopping this weekend to try to find some but we couldn't find any in her size oh man you know what? i would I, not let that happen again kids are gosh like even with stuff that isn't even a brand name i see kids nowadays wearing like acdc shirts and there was actually this one high school girl i was like Oh, what's your favorite ACDC song? Because we were like standing in the checkout line. She looked at me. She's just like, what? I go, ACDC, you have a, a shirt on. Like, what's your favorite song? She's like, oh, I don't listen to them. 
what the hell? What? <laughs> We're an ACDC shirt. Oh my god. I don't even know one of their songs. <laughs> oh man. What is going oh, on man. with kids? Oh, the world's going to hell. It is. Totally okay. going to hell. So, but speaking of going to hell, I would like to do a big shout out right now to a woman who is definitely not going to hell. Um, our super mom of the week this week is my friend, Kristen. She lives in Rhode Island. Um, and I wanted to nominate her because she absolutely continues to rock motherhood. Um, she is a single mom. She is in college, which is huge for her. Um, she has not been giving up on her job search. She allows her children to be themselves, and she constantly keeps an open mind about anything her children bring to her. Um, and she doesn't allow the discourse in her marriage or employment or any troubles that she's having in school. She does not let any of that affect her parenting and her outlook on parenting. Um, I, I understand that everybody struggles. I struggle like crazy too. Um, mothers in general struggle because of inaccurate stereotypes or the unattainable expectations that society puts on us. Kristen has been dealt a very difficult hand um, aside from the stereotypes and the expectations of society. Um, she has been dealt an incredibly difficult hand uh, regardless of the time frame in her life that, that you're looking at. It just has not been easy for her. Um, but she does everything she can to make things work. She's doing absolutely everything she needs to do. Um, she did not graduate from high school, but last year, I am so super proud of her. She went back and got her GED in just a couple of weeks. By the time she started it, she was behind and she ended up graduating and she's now taking college courses and pursuing her career. And I think that is absolutely incredible. That's just such a great story for anybody. But in the midst of changing her life and her children's lives, she's doing it all on her own. Um, she has so much on her plate, but she still offers to help those people around her who may also be struggling. She will put herself out there to help other people struggling because she doesn't like to see anybody struggle. She's a fantastic mother. She's a, the ideal mother figure. Um, her children have approached her with personal matters of which I will not include specifics due to privacy. Um, but Kristen has remained open-minded and accepting of anything her children bring forward. So I think we can all take a page out of Kristen's book and understand that although we all went through many of the same challenges our children faced today, there are many more that we may not have faced. Just remaining open to what our children tell us and validating their feelings will keep them talking to us when things matter the most. When they're in trouble, they will come to us because they know that when they had questions about different things, they came to us and we validated them. So when they're in trouble, they're not going to fear us. They're going to feel safe with us. So Kristen, thank you for always being such an amazing friend, a mother we can all look up to, and such an incredible woman in general. You are absolutely remarkable. And honestly, I am so excited that you were able to share that story with us because we need more moms out there to get recognition for the things that they do every day. Because honestly, while it might seem small to us in the moment, it can make a huge impact that can last oh, for an entire child's life as well as inspire other moms. So Kristen, you are amazing. And I'm not just saying that lightly. What you have done is incredible and you deserve all the recognition for that. Like you're, you're cool. I want to be more. I like you. You hear that Kristen? You're cool. You're cool. <laughs> so to all of our drinking mommies tonight, really thank you for joining us for tonight's segment. We hope that you like the new format that we've been working on. We're pretty excited to share it with all of you. If you have any other moms that you would like to nominate, as we mentioned at the start of the segment, 
please feel free to join our Facebook page at Drinking Mommies and share any amazing moms, even if it's a self-mom, you know, self-mom like nomination. We totally, we get that. Oh, you ladies, I'll accept that. Nominate yourself, pat yeah. yourself on the back because a lot of times you deserve a pat on the back, but nobody's going to do it but yourself. Yep. So do it, ladies. We'll totally appreciate that. And we would be honored to show you on our segment. So with that, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. And we look forward to joining you next week on our next podcast. Bye.